with the debate. I would like to, to know uh, briefly from, from the panelists, uh, how is your organization working in climate justice and how um, do you think you can integrate these things that we have uh, presented here as a, as a just transition, which are the key messages to build the alliances together, but not only the key messages, so it could be also like the key steps, the key tools that we can um, uh, use together. So I will uh, start with uh, Bishop Capio. You want, I would, I would like you to be brief because I would like to make you a second round of uh, questions. So please go ahead, Bishop. Thank you very much, Laura Martin. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, my dear friends. Uh, it's the morning before 12 o'clock. which brought me here. So I'm still learning. So that is my first question for your first round of questions. I am a learner. I came to listen to you, indeed as a pastor, to encourage you, to let you know that we are in solidarity with you. And you mention it, our Pope, when I get the second round, I'll come to our Pope, Francis, as again, re-dynamize, re-energize our focus, our preferential option for the poor, a church which is poor for the poor. And the poor, in quotation marks, is not only materially poor, anthropologically poor. Materially poor, yes. So any condition that does not dignify us is a poor condition. And the church is there with you since ages. From the Old Testament, Jewish time, Christian time, post-modern time, the church is still with the poor and the poorest of the poor. That is what Christ died for. That would be my first take for the first round. We are with you, workers. In the condition which is not human, which is not dignifying, the church is there to raise up the bar of hope and of solidarity and of justice. That would be my first take, but I'm not a climate, uh, justice, uh, climate justice expert. I'm not at all. I'm only came to listen to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vishy. Um, your organization work in the justice and how do you see you we could link these uh, just transition issues thanks so um thanks for having me uh this is a great event that i wow really close okay <laughs> too much too much um so thanks to ituc for organizing this dialogue and um, how ITUC have organized this event is partly how I think the way forward will come. So to answer the original question, ActionAid is a development organization working in 45 countries around the world with people in thousands of communities, the poorest communities. So for us, climate change um, and climate justice has had to become an integral part of our work in tackling poverty and inequality around the world
um, climate change in such an unsustainable way. So for us, you know, tackling this agenda, and we've, we've picking up also on what Kumi said um, as a challenge, as a sort of self-critical challenge to NGOs about not being uh, radical enough, uh, perhaps in the last few years, we at ActionAid have been challenging ourselves about how to connect um, all of these issues that we see uh, facing the people that we're working with and working alongside um, and trying to connect them much more deeply, the struggle for climate justice, for women's rights, uh, for tax, for a more redistributive um, tax, uh, tax system, uh, better public services uh, for women that respond to women's needs. Um, all of these better, more decent jobs, better jobs, greener jobs. How do we connect all of these things into um, a narrative that really goes to the heart of, of uh, the economic system that needs to change and the inequalities that are driving it? And, and I think for us, part of the answer is, is about making those inequalities uh, visible. So a specific example would be here at COP. We need to be really clear that it's the inequalities and the power imbalance between rich and poor countries that are at the heart of a lot of the problems with the deal at the moment. We need to make that visible and, and visceral to people um, as the story of what's going on here uh, and the inequalities that, that are driving that, that Kumi and others went through in the last session about what's behind that. Um, so we need to make sure we, we set out an agenda that, that really goes to the heart of the problem and the systemic nature of the change that, that we need to tackle. Um, setting out that a bold, radical agenda for change that will speak to different people and, and different movements um, of the, to the things that they want to see change in their lives on land reform, on decent jobs, better wages, um, all of these things and connect ourselves together across movements, faith, environment, the feminist movement, development NGOs, labour. Um, and then I think that the third important component about how we do it is largely about building power from below. So it's important for us to have our, uh, our analysis and our framework right at, at, at a global level, you know, to make sure that we're supporting and lifting up those, those struggles. But a lot of the organising, the change will be driven um, by people organising locally and nationally um, and pushing for change. I'll leave it there as the opening bit. Thank you very much, um, Tim. So, uh, Bobby, it's your turn. I think you have a few slides. been able to it's not it's from the CSIR the Center for um, industrial yeah uh, yeah just watch that Center for industrial research in South Africa that's is what's happening to Africa and that is gonna what that's gonna happen there's nothing absolutely nothing we can do to stop that because we've left it too late and because the negotiations in there are failing. I'm not saying that. I would like to ditto two members here today. Australia, Colin, was very frustrated about the gap between what is here and what is there. And then the union representative from Canada who said, why are we involved in accords that are not delivering? And the reality is that as we fail at these UNFCCC negotiations, the world increasingly warms up. Now I work in a, I worked and I lived 143 meters away from ExxonMobil oil refinery. I suffered from asthma, but I was lucky. While my parents were working class, they had enough money to ship me out of the neighborhood so I can get a good education and good health 900 kilometers away in a rural area. 
the majority of the world and the poor cannot do that. And we saw the waste pickers, groundwork and myself, we work with waste pickers every day, trying to work with assisting them in their organizing, in their mobilizing, because they, that is the solution of tomorrow. That is what we need to be doing, is to be working at that very local level with people who are doing something, not negotiating, but doing something. We are working with local municipalities that are indebted to major energy utilities and in South Africa, we only have one, ESCOM, to be able to say to the municipalities at a very local level, what can you do differently to be able to not be dependent upon ESCOM and coal-fired electricity that kills people, but indebts, indebts the municipality? So that's the just transition we need, is to be able to move with local municipalities and with people to a, a new tomorrow and and that is critical and that's happening globally because part of what groundwork is is friends of the earth international and we work in in more than 75 countries trying to carry that narrative through to be able to say those to be able to say to those that are powerful actually you know what we don't trust you and for the last week from monday to friday i was in a very interesting meeting with waste pickers and the waste pickers at that meeting, from all around the world, from India, from Colombia, from South Africa, in a statement at the end of the meeting said, we don't trust the leadership in La Bourget to come up with a solution. We have to trust ourselves. And that was the, the, the final statement made by the Global Anti-Incineration Alliance, who are linked to waste pickers throughout the world. And that's what we need to, to be able to start considering. But what's really, really critical is that it's again the unions. The National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa, Carl Klute, said in Boston in 2012 that we cannot trust the UNFCCC to make the changes that are drastically needed to stop the world you know, destroy, being destroyed. It is left up to unions, it's left up to community people, and it's left up to the NGOs to be able to work together and make that change happen. And not be led into a false sense of hope that by being with power, that actually, as Kumi said, you are making a difference. And I want to stop and I want to quote what happened in Bonn in October this year. And this is why I'm very skeptical about what's happening in there. Because it's not democratic. And the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs representative said, we have a very short time for serious negotiations. Diplomats know real negotiations cannot happen in front of the public. If we open spin-offs to observers, we will need another group to do the real negotiations. This is not the time for such show, but for real negotiations. So real negotiations can't happen in front of you and me. And the question I have for us, when all of this fails on Friday, what are we going to be doing on Saturday? Leo, you have the floor. Thank you, Laura. Uh, first of all, thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure being here with you all. Um, I think that uh, I had many things to to say that maybe won't fit uh, in that very precise question that you made. Uh, but I think that uh, from a trade union perspective, uh, and here everything I say is from a good Brazil perspective, so from a southern perspective, um, we have a challenge as a trade union movement, which is to overcome the traditional divide between protecting jobs and protecting the environment. And of course, everybody in this room knows that. And uh, I understand that you're part of um, the, the part of the labor movement that uh, understands that uh, this divide needs to be overcome. Uh, but we know that uh, that's not the case uh, for the totality of our movement 
uh, and especially when it comes to more uh, economic discussions. So, um, on one side, uh, in Latin America, through uh, ITUC Americas, we have been doing our work for quite some time uh, on developing, on one side, social alliances uh, with other actors, not only environment actors or environment NGOs, uh, but also women's groups, indigenous people's groups, groups that deal with debt issues, because as you know, uh, this whole um, agreement that's been, uh, or maybe not agreed here in Paris, but the whole structure and the logic of the, the thing uh, is going to build a new financial market based on carbon. And as we know, uh, at least since 2008, uh, in a liberal or if you prefer in a neoliberal world economic order, um, free financial markets tend to lead to speculation and financial crisis. So we are opening a new front for a new financial crisis that is still to come and that will be based on the financialization of nature and on carbon markets. So dealing with uh, debt groups has been uh, also important for us uh, in this process in Latin America. Of course, we have a very um, long history of working with uh, Friends of the Earth or Action Aid, especially on food security and food sovereignty issues uh, involving our um, our countryside uh, unions that uh, deal with food production. Uh, but also, um, we need to take into account the frontline communities that, uh, as they say, at least uh, in Latin America, operate and uh, live and work and act at the actual territories where uh, climate change um, presents its most severe consequences first. Um, and then I come back to our original uh, trade union environment uh, divide because I think we need to reflect upon what is our territory? Where is uh, climate change uh, affecting us in the ground level? And of course, everybody in this room is well aware of the climate change issues and the importance of linkage between uh, labor issues and climate change issues. But um, at least as far as uh, my knowledge about the labor movement, we still have a long way to go to bring those questions down to our affiliates and uh, to uh, rank and file members in general. Uh, so there's a lot of educational work to do. Um, conscience building uh, around those issues. Um, I invite you all to read a document that ITUC Americas has produced, I guess, two years ago, which is the Labor Development Platform for the Americas, which is a very interesting document. It's a short document uh, used to do uh, workers' education. But the interesting thing is that it was written in partnership with other social movements. So, um, when we talk about agriculture, we're not talking what we as trade unionists think about agriculture. It's a result of a fruitful dialogue with uh, agriculture involved uh, social movements and other issues in the same line. Um, so it's available for download if you want. Uh, I just want to mention one other thing to conclude this first uh, question, uh, which is when I saw the uh, way speaker's video, I was very, um, glad to remember that uh, it was the Workers' Party government under President Lula who officially recognized waste picking as a formal job and allowed legally them to organize around cooperatives and uh, waste pickers uh, enterprises. And that, uh, why I'm saying that? Because that brings us to the discussion of the role of the state, which is something that has been undermined uh, for decades now, by the neoliberal ideology, by structural adjustment, and by the pressures by um, the private sector. And uh, what we are seeing here at the COP, and, but not only here uh, in the climate talks, but also when we talk about the TISA, the TISA agreement on services, 
the Trans-Pacific Partnership or the Transatlantic Partnership or all those new free trade agreements that are being pushed forward, uh, especially by the US, is that the governments that are negotiating there actually do not have the autonomy to decide which policies they will choose because multilateralism are being, is being replaced by multi-stakeholderism and the stakeholders uh, we know exactly who they are. I mean, we are called stakeholders, but the private sector is actually the key stakeholder playing uh, a role in those negotiations. So uh, the role of the state is something that for us is central, uh, especially when we want to fight uh, poverty. Thanks. Thank you very much, Diego. And now I want to hear from you, from from the rest of the panelists of uh, today, and just to reflect on these same questions, on this same reflection: how to build alliance and how to consolidate. Which are the issues? Which are the steps that we have to take among our movements, among the trade union movement? I'm going to give uh, a few uh, words, please try to be brief, uh, talk to the mic and uh, uh, present yourself slowly for the interpreters to do their job. So. Hello, uh, Mark Lampson speaking from the Campaign Against Climate Change in the UK. I think the key question here in terms of uniting uh, the different social movements around issues is to make the question of climate change and environmental uh, problems in general concrete for ordinary people. I, I'll give one example from where I come from in, in Britain. Last winter there were 44,000 excess deaths amongst old people who couldn't afford to heat their homes during the, uh, during the winter in the fourth richest economy in the world. That is, there is a direct link for the trade union movement there. We have to say, as a trade union movement, we need to create jobs, particularly for young people, to go around to every old person's home in the country to insulate it, which will have the effect of saving their lives and reducing carbon emissions, as well as giving young people jobs. The problem we have is we're too abstract. We say we want a just transition, but we don't spell out what that is. That means, as a trade union movement, we can then approach other social movements, other forces in society to say, these are the concrete things we want to fight for and organize for. Will you join with us in that, in that struggle? And then we, we also have to widen out the issues. You see, I'm very glad the last speaker mentioned the role of the state. This can only happen with state action. And that, if we, to get that state action, we will need to build a social movement that can force the change from, uh, from, from, from the governments. But to get that social movement, we have to make people feel that they've got something that they can be part of, rather than just an abstract series of political demands. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Pam Tao Lee. Uh, I'm one of the uh, founders of a, a group called the Just Transition Alliance. About 20 years ago, we worked with Tony Mazaki and the oil, chemical, and atomic workers. Uh, and what our project was to bring together uh, the workers that in the, in the polluting uh, industries, toxic industries, together with frontline communities outside, uh, to be able to create uh, policies and strategies uh, to be able to uh, have a just transition for those workers. Tony was a visionary that knew that we had to deal with the issue of climate justice uh, and knew that industries such as his needed to be shut down and what to do with the workers. And so his uh, conception and his approach to people like me, uh, I am from the Asian Pacific Environmental Network. I work with the Indigenous Environmental Network and others. Uh, is to come together to be able to create, facilitate dialogue between the workers inside those plants and those who were impacted outside. Uh, the vision for the workers inside that Tony was um, advocating was based on the GI Bill uh, where after World War II, soldiers coming home would be able to have funds uh, to go to school and to be able to uh, seek jobs. So his uh, conception that he proposed to us was to have uh, the state uh, provide a just transition, a super fund for just transition that would uh, enable the workers inside those factories to be able to seek jobs that are safe, health and safety wise, decent, um, and uh, equivalent to what they were doing inside those plants. 
And for us on the outside who were experiencing asthma, cancer, uh, birth uh, 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 issues, uh, reproductive issues, and others, uh, toxic uh, 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 soil, land, and water, um, that we would be able to identify uh, based on those particular areas our needs. I'd like to give an example. Um, an example would be uh, in with the indigenous, uh, with the paper workers, uh, the indigenous stepped forward and said, we need to talk about the dioxins that are coming out of your factories and into our rivers and killing our fish. And the workers inside the uh, uh, paper mill said, we need to talk to you guys about our upcoming contracts and our health and safety issues. And they're natural allies. Uh, and that together to be able to work uh, to 